in school teaching, oration, and administration. He's a self-motivated, passionate, and dynamic educator who believes in modern education. Uh, Vishnu encourages creativity and innovation, both teachers and students. Equipped with a master's degree in applied biological sciences from Oxford University, Dr. Vishnu has recipient of some renowned scholarships awarded organizations like Commonwealth, World Bank, and the GRF and the NEC. Welcome, Vishnu. Thank you. Um, moving to Ms. Anupama Ghai. Ms. Anupama is a management graduate and worked in the education sector for over the last 19, over the last nine years, sorry, of her 20 plus years of work life. She has worked with the British Council and the Tata Consultancy Services Limited, where she has led on large scale commercial as well as impact driven education projects with state governments in India. As a principal advisor in India to the University of Sydney, she's responsible for its India operations and aspiration to be preferred a study des destination for the bright, aspiring um, Indian students. Welcome, Anupama. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Celia Flores is an educator at heart and has invested in the holistic well-being of her, of her students. She has been teaching for 30 years around the world and has had an opportunity to come alongside children from more than 30 different nationalities and from all walks of life. She's also an author, illustrator for children's books, and is the co-founder of uh, Kolitas Itrensitas. Did I get that correct, Cecilia, or I just completely... Perfect. Oh, Thank you. great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome, Cecilia. Looking forward to some great discussions. Um, our sixth panelist today is Mr. Sid Balida. Uh, Mr. Sid is a group head, uh, group marketing head of the Excellencia in Film and Essentia Schools, Seven Excellencia Junior College and Teach Tigers, which is an edtech startup. Prior working with Excellencia, he headed marketing at the International School in India. He has hosted senior leaders from NASCOM, Toyota, GM, LNC, and Deloitte, Microsoft, Tata Communications, etc., and engaged them in intellectually stimulating debates on risk of interest to the industry, academic fraternity, and rural community. And last but not the least, uh, Mr. Rahul Siddharth. As a co founder and CEO of Verificent Technologies, Rahul is responsible for overall operations, branding, and strategy while all supporting business development efforts. His background experience includes business consulting, meeting, art directing, and project management. Raul has won about 40 Creative Excellence Awards while working at Comedy Wire, SCG Creative, Align Craft, Grey Advertising, Bernard Hodes Group, Jack Morton Worldwide, RSP Design, and One Source, to name a few. He has an MFA in Design and Technology from Parsons School of Design and a BS in Mining from Fairfield University. A very, very warm welcome to all of you, dear panelists. I'm really looking forward to a great discussion today, uh, which without uh, much further ado, let's just get into our, our discussion. We are all here today to talk about something which is exceedingly important, which is thing that none of us actually uh, you know, predicted would thought that would happen, but it did. Um, so in the world of WID, we are actually here today to discuss education and the post-COVID world. Uh, this particular virus, COVID-19, has forced schools and teachers to change how they educate the students and themselves. And with no clear end in sight, um, schools and colleges are really going through some difficult times. Many students are desperate to get back to schools and institutions, I'm sure most of them, but with the pandemic still raging and getting worse globally, um, it has made the reopening of all these institutions quite challenging, if not elusive. In such a situation, um, you know, will the schools and institutions go back to being exactly the way they were, this crisis, or will they change forever? Um, this is what we are here to discuss today. Um, about how the COVID paradigm will transform schools and educational institutions globally. We are looking at a paradigm shift in education, and we are just trying to understand through the eyes and views of, of the seven of you to see how this is going to have an impact on the changing world of education. 
So we'll start with the first question, which is all of you, and you can all take about three to four minutes, talk about it um, as, you know, whatever you think about the question, will the, will the pandemic alter the ways of working of schools, institutions forever? Are we ever going to get back to the way we were? Or the schools are going to adapt and change the way they have functioned? Let's start with you, Sheetal, and then we will take one panelist at a time and let's hear all of you out and see how you feel about it. Thanks, uh, Ingur. Thank, yes, thank you for your question and also the introduction. It's great to see like-minded people on this panel and I'm looking forward to that discussion. Now to your first question, that is the pandemic going to really alter the ways permanently? In short, the answer is yes. But I also think that it is a great question to begin this panel with, because uh, I think that we are offered an opportunity to, act, to rethink the paradigm. If you look at you know, how education is set up, since the, two, since the past 200 years, we have been working within the same framework. We've changed the framework, you know, with curriculum developments, you saw IB coming in, you know, the international baccalaureate, you saw internationalization of education, but we've never really been uh, shaken up to such an extent that the framework just collapsed, which meant that it is a challenge, but it also presents us with a great opportunity. And if you look at the Spanish flu 100 years ago, then the two world wars, after that, this is the first big challenge and therefore first big opportunity for us to rethink from a design point of view. And that's why you see people with different backgrounds on this panel talking about design, talking about rethinking how we can offer education. So in that sense, the first six months of the pandemic, we were reactive. You know, it was something that hit us. We were trying to create a new baseline because we had never dealt with it. And therefore, now we have an opportunity to be reflective and proactive. But what can we take from this experience and therefore really transform education to suit the needs of its key stakeholders? And who are the stakeholders? It's the students, it's the faculty and teachers, it's the parents, and it's, of course, administration as well, because I see so many of my colleagues here who are in management and administration of an educational institution. And we've never seen that kind of pressure. So in that sense, it's a great opportunity for resource mapping. We assess our functionality and we look at the differential impact because again, COVID will impact the early years education differently, middle years, high, high school and university. So each section or each group will have its own needs. So we definitely have a new baseline. The challenge has presented itself with a lot of opportunities and I do think that it will also offer us an opportunity to think about this socially. We, everybody doesn't have the same access to education. So the group that we are talking about is with an assumption that they have enough of internet connectivity, they have the resources, a fully functioning laptop with its educational technology tools, and that they have the space to be able to attend an online session without any disturbance. So there are so many different factors and therefore, again, as an educator and change maker, I think this is a great opportunity to optimize so we can move forward in the right direction. So in a nutshell, Ingur, that's my response that yes, it has changed the way we see the world and the way we educate and a lot of learnings from this. And I'm sure that the rest of the questions, we will unpack these different questions. So over to you, right. Ingur. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Anupama, would you yeah. like to share your views? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, that was really uh, interesting, uh, you know, observations from uh, our my previous colleague. And, you know, so basically, I think the, um, the new normal will be uh, bringing in flexibility into the education system, which she has already, uh, you know, talked about. Uh, but yes, the use of technology and seamless transition to hybrid mode of teaching, combining face to face uh, with remote learning, uh, that will be the key, in my opinion. And the education system will have to be prepared for eventualities like COVID-19. And I think the flexibilities will built into the systems automatically. Um, what COVID crisis may have done um, is uh, change our outlook and it has amplified the need and uh, need to change and adapt our education, education system um, so that we are better able to prepare our young learners for what the future might hold. 
Um, it has also given, uh, definitely given a push to digitalization of uh, the education sector. Um, two, two, three things I think are here to stay. One is the blended learning, uh, which has become a reality. Um, artificial intelligence, uh, which will uh, help us move away from uh, you know, one size fits all approach. Um, and definitely will offer a unique learning experience suited to individuals learning needs. And technology has been uh, in use for quite uh, um, many years and it will continue to be uh, used effectively. And I think we need to uh, look at uh, how we can use this technology to reduce the, the time spent by teachers on the mundane tasks, which can easily be automated. For example, paper setting, evaluating, grading, these are the things which can be automated uh, you know, very, very easily. And the, it can really give, uh, uh, you know, bring in a shift for, uh, in the role of the teacher from being uh, a knowledge giver to a facilitator. Um, I think at University of Sydney, we are constantly trying to unlearn and relearn and align ourselves with these changing needs. And we've been challenging, challenging traditions um, for almost 160 years. And the main sole aim uh, for us is to develop future ready graduates. Uh, Would, who would have the skills, knowledge, and changing world. So in a nutshell, that's what uh, my opinion would be. Yeah, thanks, Anubhuma. I, I, when I joined the world of IB, unlearn and relearn is something that, you know, we used to hear all the time. And if nothing else, the pandemic has really taught us how to unlearn, relearn things. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Praveena, your, your thought on this. Thank you. I absolutely agree with the former two speakers in the sense that um, the education system, as we know it, is going to change, um, and the change has started. And I think where it has started is in our mindset itself. Um, you know, we've known this for, for a while that, um, you know, the education system has to change, the world around us is changing, and yet, um, as a whole, as, as a country and as a world, the movement wasn't strong enough to actually catch up with the kind of change that was required to have taken place in education. And I think um, this pandemic has forced everyone to step outside the comfort zone and break that cycle that we've taken for granted for centuries now. The education system that is basically factory model of education system. Uh, we were so comfortable with that model. And um, you know, as a world, we were overall very comfortable with that model. And it has forced each and every educator to step outside that comfort zone, whether it is as simple as you know, uh, sending assignments through email or trying to think about innovative ways to teach PE virtually, or even you know, have sessions like this and share um, you know, amongst uh, colleagues different ideas and learn and grow from it. So it has really, really broken that mindset that this has always worked for us and hence that's why we'll continue doing this. Um, and I think this, this wheel has started now and um, the development is going to be that much faster uh, from this point on. And we can also see that with the um, you know, entry of private companies who want to, you know, um, you know, um, who introduced uh, systems like LMS and, um, you know, other uh, programs for schools to digitize education and to support that. And uh, with this, um, I can see this, this becoming more and more, um, you know, in place in the future, uh, which is going to help us in this movement of being more future ready and being more relevant as educators. Um, and as uh, earlier, I think, uh, Ms. Sheetal had um, mentioned about, you know, the greater impact um, with access to education. Um, because I'm from Nepal, um, it's always been a matter of concern to me. Like, you know, I, I run an IV school in Nepal and uh, we're very fortunate and our children are very fortunate to have such a wonderful education. But then it, this is not the case throughout Nepal. Um, there are still um, schools all over Nepal and finish the entire school year without access to even a proper textbook, let alone a uh, you know, quality educator, because nobody wants to go to remote areas and teach them. I think uh, digitization and education, this really opens up access to education for children, even in remote places as well, where we can um, you know, provide them access to quality resources, quality, um, you know, even educators and the trainers um, in many ways. And I'm, I'm actually very, very 
hopeful and very optimistic with the kind of change that I'm um, you know, foreseeing um, for the future of, of a world. Thank you. Thanks, Ravina. Because on the topic of digitization and you know how quickly digitization is taking over the world of education. Before I move to uh, Cecilia, I would just take a comment from Rahul. Uh, you know, if you would like to uh, add up into this. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, the remarks by the other uh, panelists are very spot on. So the quick answer is I also agree, yes, that it's going to change. We're always progressing forward. You know, I think that, um, you know, in a higher sort of philosophical approach to this is that, wh why are we going to school? Like why are, stu you know, we are bringing students to go through that factory model for an, an older way to, uh, to, to, to learn. So my, my point was that like, We've been training, we've been learning, uh, training our, our, our kids to go through this factory program to work at an office, right? Like we're becoming a service provider. And yes, there's gonna be people that go through paths to engineering and who's going to become leaders and, and managers, but oftentimes that we have been training them to go through the office. And now I feel that um, what COVID pandemic last year on earth was that there are different ways for people to have a joyful living. And so having them be able to work or to study remotely uh, can expose them that they can go do different things. They don't need to be in the classroom. People learn different ways. Like, and they, and some oftentimes, even many of us, we don't always want to be in the office in the school. Sometimes we need to be home. We need to sort of surprise ourselves. So I think that moving forward that, um, we, we'll see that public health is going to be a big part of education, making sure that we can't stuff so many students in a classroom. I think that uh, on the institution side, you know, right, there's, there's profit that's, that's needed for institutions to uh, bring more uh, education. They can now start opening up their enrollments. They don't need to be in, this, in a five mile radius, 10 mile radius. They can do cross across borders, international students. And you know, the, the biggest teacher around the world right now is YouTube. People are learning from YouTube so much, uh, learning, you know, how to, how to cook uh, a new meal, uh, how to fix something. Those are ways that we can learn. So people have been learning through video and through, uh, you know, through the digital medium. All of that needs to be harnessed moving forward. I think what it, what it has uh, em empowered all of us and, and educators as well of understanding that people learn different ways. We need to uh, capture that, harness that moving forward, allow more space in the classrooms, give the you know, options of people uh, of you know, studying from home, giving the option to coming into person so there's, there's more attention. So I think that uh, I agree that after the, the, the Spanish flu, there was the roaring 20s, there's going to be a great paradigm shift a revolution of understanding how education can be democratized, go cross borders. And I think it's gonna be a great time for people to learn. So yes, I'm the quick answer. Yeah, thanks, Raul. Cecilia? Um, hello, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, you know, I think um, education is a changing process and it has been changing since ever. <laughs> so I guess, yes, it's, it's affecting the way that we work, but something that we must remember is um, that we chose one of the most human uh, professions of all. And even though we need to take all those skills that we have with technology, we must remember that that's what we want to do with the kids. Uh, we want to fight up to develop those skills you know in in education many times you have here like oh it's because we are in the same boat but actually um my perspective is we are not in the same boat we are under the same storm right now but everybody's coming with a different boat everybody's coming from a different set of skills 
And we need to embrace the kind of collaboration that is happening right now, the kind of um, empathy that students are developing for each other when they want to support uh, one of their friends that they cannot <laughs> catch up with the technology. There are so many things that we need to be aware and we need to really bring them to the table. Not, I mean, technology is great. And the fact that it can reach many people around the world is, is fantastic. But at the same time, we have to remember that this change, it has to be for good. It has to be for something that is gonna push us to be better, to be better humans, better world, like not to, back, to go back to the normality that I don't know what normality is, but actually right. to, to consider the fact that we are dealing with people. We are facing our kids that are at home and probably we are the only face that they are seeing outside of their families. So it is very important that yes, we, we take care of the, te of the technology that is there, that is um, getting more accessible for everyone, but we must keep that human part. That is what makes us unique that it was make uh, education uh, a process where we can become really lifelong learners. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. We agree to an extent, you know, that this is this is a storm and everybody's coming in with their own boats. You know, we have our own challenges. Every school, every institution has their own challenges in this pandemic. And it's sometimes difficult to gauge, you know, what other people, other institutions are going through other than yours. So yeah, thank you for your insights. Uh, Dr. Vishnu, um, let's hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Ingur, um, for that lovely introduction. And uh, what a pleasure, uh, you know, just learned in five, 10 minutes, uh, listening to the panelists. And, you know, I was deflecting upon what would be my contribution on this point, because there's so many things have been covered. But let me just highlight a few things. And this is very important. I feel like when you are on the school campus, this is very important that we look at our origin and the process of evolution. So very uh, interestingly, I, I'm a biologist and uh, kind of study lots of geography. So we'd like to bring these connections here. Uh, the, the very important thing is that you have change and now this change could be sudden or gradual. Now the sudden change, we all know biologically, we call it as mutation and the gradual change is the evolution. But between these, th uh, these things, what happens, you have adaptation. In the process of adaptation, you start utilizing the resources. The development happens. The habits will be developed. Different norms, different ways of life will be generated from here. So it's very interesting to accept the fact that due to this change, isolation happens and isolation leads to speciation. So if you connect all these threads, it's very interesting and we should be very, very confident of we will be growing very, very strong in coming future. If we are able to see and connect all those things we know we are talking about the most strongest species that is human. And we are talking about the survival of the fittest. So if you look at all these things, I am very, very confident. We may take some time as, as I think Ms. Sheetal mentioned here that it depends upon the age group you belong to or you, you are associated with. The, the college will, uh, college have, uh, have been affected differently than the school. So I feel like the normalcy has to, it is important to come back uh, very quickly in school, but I have my doubt in college, it is gonna come in next 10 years also. I agree with what Mr. Rahul mentioned here. So, you know, it is very important to connect and be confident, be positive about these changes. And that is what my take on this. But thank you very much for all your inputs, what you contributed. I just wanted to leave it at that point. Yeah, the conversation is getting interesting because yeah, we all we all know and understand you know how this this situation has panned out, but to put it from multiple perspectives is, is really it's really interesting. Uh, as I said, um, 
your your take on the post covid world and you know how how we are going to be you know adjusting to this and how it has affected us yeah thank you ingur i will just maybe share quickly about uh, our experience uh, dealing with this situation in the last uh, one year so as i said i represent uh, excellentia group we run about seven junior colleges and uh, two schools in hyderabad uh, so in the last one year the college has been impacted a little more differently compared to the school college our college attracts students from across uh, telangana and andhra pradesh so remotest of corners they come to hyderabad to study uh, in our college campuses so during the last one year the children were students were sent back home due to covid and uh, accessing classes online was a challenge because it is not hyderabad bangalore new delhi or mumbai so access to infrastructure access to good quality internet was challenge number 1 for the children for the students so they could not uh, get access to maybe assignments or attend real time classes uh, because of power issues because of internet issues or maybe lack of access to good devices so devices still they could manage but access to power and access to internet was the biggest challenge coming to school segment uh, children felt very very isolated sitting at home and uh, i think that's going to have a very a uh, long term impact so uh, i think we should not really go for dramatic change at least in the school segment because social interaction is very critical at this stage at university level college level uh, maybe it does not matter that much but completely going online for school could be difficult that's the feedback that i got from parents as well as from children so they enjoy more being at school they enjoy learning from peers rather than maybe sitting at home and staring at the screen and trying to get assignments downloaded or accessing lectures there so that is how our uh, segment has been impacted so infrastructure change access to good quality electricity power and infrastructure wifi connections i think if that is sorted out which may take time in the remote corners unless that is done i don't see a dramatic change happening uh, in the school and college segment for a couple of years thank you sir um, i'm going to just pick up the next question there itself you know um, i remember having a conversation with one of my ceos about 10 years ago you know 10 10 years ago you know when um, google had become really popular and there was this whole idea of you know why do you need schools anymore i mean if schools are about knowledge creation and about knowledge acquisition then you don't need the buildings anymore everything is at a click of a button you click the button everything is in front of you don't really need teachers you don't really need schools and um again this is my my personal understanding of the situation has been that you know um if if anything else this pandemic has proved to us that important schools are how important it is students to go out there into their buildings with their friends spending time you know falling getting up having those conversations you know having those fights it is so important for social and emotional well being of students to be a part of that of a learning environment but yes you know having said that i think moving forward i think blended learn is what is going to be uh, the talk of of you know schools for and colleges for you know for for years to come so just to understand you know what what would all want your educators or people working in your organizations to take forward into the post covid world you know in terms of strategies in terms of how you see your schools or institutions getting aligned after uh, post pandemic Uh, Ms. Dr. Sheetal, if we could start with you, and then, you know, continue uh, with all the other panelists. Thanks, Singer. Um, I am actually glad that I'm taking, uh, you know, this question after Sid's point and after what yeah. Vishnu brought to the table, because right. I like the example that Vishnu used about biology, you know, and again linking it to Cecilia's point as well that we are in the same storm with different boats. because all three have really addressed an important point which is student equity so yes we need to remember that technology and therefore all the educational technology tools which we will carry forward post this pandemic are enablers they won't replace uh, what the school system offers and i think that distinction we need to have very clear as educators that what schools offer especially for again the different age groups it is part of the developmental process and i say that also as a psychologist technology will not be able to replace that but can positively enable that and i think that is how if we if that's the lens we view 
then we can work very well with technology, keeping in mind the access to technology and the student equity issues as how I describe it to what, you know, what Sid highlighted. So what we will carry forward is definitely use of these educational technology tools. Another distinction is that some of our faculty members, and I'm looking at this from, an ed, uh, from a university education perspective, we were already familiar with tools like Canvas, Blackboard, using course eval for course evaluation, the connections platform for grade entry. So education has been digitally transformed for university students in many parts of the world already. The big change that COVID uh, you know, resulted in was that it was not only the early adopters of technology, it, this was forced inclusion. That everyone that was teaching needed to learn these new skills. Therefore, another thing to your question, Ingur, what we will take forward is being collaborative learners. You know, the dynamics between a teacher and a student so a faculty and a student have been brilliantly changed and transformed. So in Vishnu's word, there's mutation and whatever is the next step. Because I saw in classrooms where students were guiding faculty to say, okay, you know, maybe you can try this on Zoom. And before Zoom, we were using WebEx. And it was a complete game changer there, right? So that's an interesting take, you know, point to take forward as well, that a power dynamic in education, which usually has a lot of snobbery, uh, you know, academia is known for its snobbery. That has changed because somewhere we've become more collaborative. To a social point, I would like to bring to the table that one of the things that we will take forward is care over contract. That our faculty, and I, I'm sure that you saw this in your teachers, you know, in your educators that you have in your team, that who have not only walked an extra mile, but God knows how many extra miles to look at that particular student who has had challenges, whether it's connectivity, whether it's, uh, you know, um, probably just one working laptop but for two or three children in that household. So again, the social dynamic and student equity, and therefore this beautiful term that I use very often, which is care over contract. These will all be things that we will carry forward. So the digital transformation is of course this forced inclusion, but we have to view technology as an enabler, not as a replacement. And just one last point, Ingur, uh, before I hand over to you, an anecdote on Google especially. I work with teenagers and young adults, and trust me, to gauge and their attention and hold their attention has been a very interesting challenge. Uh, challenge. My first sentence in every class that I teach is, you're sitting in that class, either virtually or physically, because you can't Google what I'm gonna share. So unless I put my lecture on YouTube, what we're going to discuss, how we're going to, you know, unpack this uh, problem that we're going to discuss is not going to be taught by YouTube. And that's why you need to be here. So I think right. education in terms of what school brings in terms of social interaction, you know, learning values, life skills cannot be replaced. At the same time, technology can be a big facilitator and enabler. And hopefully in the future, to Sid's point, if we have those infrastructure issues resolved, it can really be a game changer in terms of access to education. So on that note, back to you, Ingo. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's uh, acknowledged to be looked at as an enabler. Um, and yeah, the more we get to the grassroots level, because you know, when you read the statistics of how many students and how many kids worldwide have been affected, uh, you know, how uh, because of the pandemic and their education has been affected, it's, it's quite startling and um, disheartening actually that you know so many kids for the last one year have had no access to education because they don't have access to technology. So that is, I think, for the governments worldwide to ensure that you know, forward technology became becomes an enabler, in, you know, in field of education. Education. Um, Anupama, yours on it. How does it have an impact? So, what kind of uh, things you see your teachers take to the future for college education? Um, yeah, so I mean, taking um, uh, from what Sheetal shared um, specifically about uh, care over contract, um, I would like to quote uh, Professor Anna Marie Jaggers, uh, who's the Dean Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at University of Sydney. She said, and I quote, um, we are very proud of what we managed in the crisis situations, uh, but now we are keen to have a more collective, creative, and purposive approach to online learning that puts student belonging and engagement 
at the center of rich online learning communities, unquote. So basically, uh, you know, talking about what uh, Sheetal was sharing about technology being enabler. And I think we have at the university, we have already uh, seen the benefits of it. And, uh, you know, I'll share a few instances here. Um, you know, some of the stellar practices that we have implemented now, um, and I think uh, will remain beyond COVID uh, are, for example, the University of Sydney um, has the largest student mobility program. Um, and when we were we took it online and virtual, um, it, this has led to uh, collaboration with industry partners around the world. And it has created even more opportunities for students uh, to gain international experience. Uh, another example I would like to uh, share here is um, about our industry and community project units. Um, uh, which brings together uh, students from um, a range of disciplines to work together and they work towards solving real world problems uh, set out by industry and community partners. These units were also moved online because of the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and the first uh, virtual international ICPU will run in September in uh, semester one, 2021, which is currently ongoing um, with Tata India. I'm taking the example of the Indian, um, uh, you know, uh, partnership here and working with India's largest power generation company, students will um, look at ways to accelerate the growth in India's renewable energy market. So um, another example that I can share here is about our virtual immersion units. Um, last year, uh, the students were able to participate um, in these units, uh, giving them an opportunity to study a new language um, and they st study a new culture, uh, working with partner universities in Italy and Germany. Um, as part of these units, uh, new students participated in uh, interactive language lessons uh, with local teachers and followed uh, the, by discussions with local students and they were able to expand their networks. Now, so these are the things, uh, you know, uh, I think are very good examples of technology being enabler and how we have uh, at the New at University of Sydney use these to the benefits of the students. So I completely agree with uh, what Sheetal had shared um, earlier. Uh, Mr. Sid, would you like to um, throw some light on how your institute plan to continue doing what they've been doing or there are some strategies they would like to add or something that would not be possible into the future, your organization? Yeah, I think in its simplest form, uh, uh, we would segregate it into two parts. One, what are the core activities and what are the non-core activities? So when it comes to core teaching and learning, I don't think there's going to be a drastic shift in the classroom learning. So that will continue. May, but due to the pandemic, we have definitely adapted to using technology more frequently. So the non-core activities, uh, maybe a parent-teacher meeting can be done online. So parents can did not come to the campus, which we used to do earlier, uh, maybe across schools in India. So that may not be uh, done online, I mean, uh, offline. Assignments and other stuff can go online again. Some of the submissions can go online. So there, there are a lot of components which does not require physical presence that, that can go online. But I think the core learning teaching cannot be replaced. In fact, very recently, I had moderated two discussions on whether robots can uh, replace teachers in the classroom. Replace teachers. <laughs> but, but it is not possible. I mean, teachers are teachers. You cannot replace the teachers with a machine. However, fancy AI and ML may look, you require a human being to deal with students, care for children, care for children. I think that is the most important part of coming to a school. So bots cannot do that. Right. I agree with you completely. I know there's a lot of experimentation going on in the field of education, you know, for this. Can robots just do the job of the teachers? But uh, being a teacher all my life, I would definitely not agree with that because I do feel and believe very, very strongly that you do need that person because of, of the human element. There is, there is, teaching is a lot out the human element and not just the knowledge. I mean, and in any case, you know, there is so much of talk for the last years and how we have moved from knowledge givers to being facilitators. And a robot, I don't think, can be a facilitator. Knowledge giver, probably, yes, to an extent. But facilitate, I, I still have my doubts that AI can do that. Probably, I, I better not challenge AI. They just come back to me and like me not wrong kinds of places. I'm just not going to comment on that. Um, Praveena, how do you see your school adapting or keeping you know, some of these strategies uh, is moving forward? 
would like to answer this question from a very macro uh, you know, perspective rather than a micro perspective, because I think um, you know, situations keep changing, settings keep changing. And also right here, we are you know, one, two, three, four, five, nine people here. Um, we might be, as Cecilia very well said earlier, we might be facing the same storm, but we're in different boats. Um, so um, I, I really don't want to focus on what exactly is it that we're doing right now uh, to continue tomorrow, because um, those specific things might, uh, the setting might change for us as well tomorrow. So what I would like to look at it is more from a macro perspective is uh, the shift in our mindset that has taken place as a result of um, COVID, I would like that to continue. And for lack of a better word, I call it entrepreneurial mindset. You know, when things change, uh, when things around you change, when what you're doing is not working, um, you have to look at it from a very um, entrepreneurial mindset and, and think, what do you have? What do you know? And what can you do differently? And how can you change things? And I think uh, whether we like it or not, each one of us has been put into that situation as a result of um, the pandemic. And I think if we continue with this mindset, um, no matter what comes tomorrow, uh, we will be able to find a way out. There is never a right answer and there's never going to be a cookie cutter way of doing things either. But so we just have to continue with that mindset. The second thing that I um, hope we continue as educators is the understanding that learning can take place anywhere, anywhere. in time. Right. Um, you know, I think prior to pandemic, most of us have taken it for granted that it is in the school where the vast majority of learning takes place, but um, it's not so. And we have, we've all um, had to be um, educators in different ways, not just as professional educators, but even parents have had to be educators and would probably never envisioned that they would ever have to take that role. So I think it has uh, broken that whole notion that it's the teacher who teach and teachers teach in schools. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, I, I hope we continue this as educators that um, there are other ways to learn as well and children can learn from anywhere. And uh, to bring back to the point uh, that Dr. Schiefel had mentioned earlier, the importance of collaboration, whether it is for us as educators and as professionals, or whether it is for students as learners, uh, we are human beings, we are people, and we learn through collaboration, we learn through interaction with others, and, um, um, you know, it helps us look at different perspectives, and, uh, you know, this is, this is, um, this is, we've, we've had to push our limits in so many ways, um, you know, to be there for each other, what we're doing right now is also the same. Right, we're here trying to hold each other's hands and sharing our um, you know, experiences and our thoughts so that we can move forward and take stronger step. And I, I hope we never lose this this value of collaboration from this point on. Thank you. No, I couldn't agree with you more. Seriously, I mean, yeah, um, Cecilia, let's hear. Um, well, um, I think something that I hope it can. Uh, happens in every place. You know, this new perspective brought us to the point to remember that we are all learners and we have to learn. We have to relearn. <laughs> we have to unlearn and then learn again how to do things yeah. now. And I think one of the things that I like the most in, in, in my school is that it gave us the opportunity, not just to the kids, but to the teachers, to the administrators, to everyone to be an active part of the learning process. Because at some point, all of us have to remember that we have to, to go back and rethink and, and value what is it that, that we're doing. Um, like somebody mentioned earlier, we are facilitators. We are not the ones that hold the truth. <laughs> you know, we need to be able to agree to disagree. We need to be able to create an environment where everybody has an opinion and everybody can contribute something. It doesn't matter if it's the younger of your students or the oldest of your faculty member. I think uh, what I hope is that this whole process is helping us to remember that the thing that is going to move us forward in education is to understand that every part of the school, uh, it doesn't matter if it's kindergarten or college, uh, we're, we're still learners. We need uh, new ways to learn and we have something that we can um, share with each other and we can appreciate in each other to, 
to bring us back to collaboration uh, and okay. to bring back the fact that it's it's only together that we're gonna really move forward. <laughs> So right, thank you, Celia. <laughs> I think um, I think we are out of time. So I'm going to go to the next question. I'm going to just jump into the question, which is about you know online examinations and a lot of schools are moving forward to you know doing exams online, doing their tests online, and just to have an understanding of you know how uh, effective these are and can really create an online environment where these tests can be done uh, you know with least element plagiarism. So I'm going to start the discussion with uh, Rahul, if you can, uh, you know, take and then we will move forward uh, from there. So examinations in COVID situation, let's look at that fact uh, also. Thank you. Um, you know, this is a little bit in the, my wheelhouse, so I'm going to be a bit biased that yes, that uh, it, we online examinations are, are going to be a little bit more popular moving forward. There's a lot of benefits to it. Um, I don't mean to change the path a little bit in the conversation, but if I could just simplify the, the uh, just reconciling one important fact that, you know, oftentimes, uh, and I apologize if I'm a bit pedestrian on this, but sometimes, you know, we have this track where we have uh, kids to study, uh, do well in school so they can do uh, well in junior high and from junior high, go to high school. So you can, why? So you can go into um, you know, a, a good college. And what's the reason doing well in college is so at the end, you know, for many of us, for some will go into research, some will continue on to med school, but a lot will be like to get a good job, right? And so oftentimes maybe education forgets to hear the demand of who's supplying these jobs, corporations and, you know, businesses, the demand and requirements of these corporations, businesses, the, 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 the popular ones or the technology ones, that skill set um, is constantly changing and it's the role of education to develop the skill sets for internal to be able to solve problems quickly. And what's happening on the corporate side is that after this pandemic, people are having, uh, having to work from home and they like working from home. And it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a um, a demographic generation one. I think 30s, 40s, those with, have, with uh, kids, they're like, you know, I don't need to uh, do the water cooler gossip, the, the, uh, the, the corporate culture. I, I'm, I'm okay. I want to save one hour commute time, two hour commute time every day so I can, I can work from home and be with my kids. There's, there's a group of generation for that. It's the young ones that just came out of college. Like, I want to get out of my house. I want to go to uh, uh, an office space for that corporate culture. So I think that what now is uh, moving forward, the, uh, corporations want to hire people who have a uh, just online credentials that they can trust and they can have the skill set to use in order for them to service their clients who are now everyone's moving online. The, you know, companies, they don't need to pay for us such expensive real estate in a city when they can do half of it and the other half can work remotely. And so it's all part of this value chain of, uh, I think one of the big roles of education is really having people understand what brings them happiness, right? It's, it's not going to be, you know, a, maybe it's going to be a job, but maybe it's going to be about the humanities. Maybe it's going to be about debates, about ideas, about problem solving. And sometimes uh, that it has to be um, baked into the cake of the, the future of education. Now, going back to assessments, so there is, you know, when the stakes are high and people are desperate, they're going to cheat. They're going to, you know, they're, they, uh, there's too much stress. So I think that the role of education needs to teach people how to take a test, how to, um, how to study, and if they're stuck studying, different ways of learning the material. So it's all a bit part of the process in order to uh, get the uh, an online credential that everyone can trust. Uh, and you know, software like ours is going to be able to deliver and close that gap. But it's it's the role of everyone uh, in in this chain to help kind of foster good people making good decisions. Because at the end of the day, people want to work with good people on good projects, and uh, if there is 
you know, some fraud in the pathway, we don't want to have people going to positions that they are not qualified to be in. And sometimes I think that there, there has been, we've all met people like that, where you meet them at a, you know, a, uh, uh, in an office or you interact with them online, wherever, and you just say, how did you get here? How is it possible that you got into, how is it, can you continuously fail forward? How can you, how is that possible? And, you know, online, online credentials and the um, deliverables of, of making sure that there hasn't been any fraud, there hasn't been any cheating, there hasn't been any challenges to the test policy, there hasn't been any testing malpractice is, is going to be part of it because, uh, you know, no, no company wants to hire someone that is not ready for the moment. Okay. Agree. Could agree more. Um, I think I'll be really running short of time. So I'm going to just go along the panelists. So Vishnu, if you could just, you know, um, stay in and your closing comments. And if you, in your closing comments, just give, um, you know, a couple of tips to our students out there, you know, um, fight this stressful situation that they're through. You're all educators and you're all very accomplished educators. Um, if you could just, you know, give them a couple of tips out if all this, if any students are listening to us, it would be a nice thing to hear from such, you know, um, educators to uh, how to, you know, deal with situation a little better. So start with Vishnu and just go to the table so we can just have your closing comments. Over to you, Vishnu. Uh, so thank you, Ingur. Uh, but just allow me to connect the previous two questions because I was oh, sure. Go ahead. listening to uh, Ms. Parvina, beautiful point, what she mentioned about the macro view she was actually, she did mention. And also I'm going to connect to um, what Sid also mentioned uh, uh, as such. So very interestingly, when I was listening to Ms. Parvina, uh, she talked about the macro view. I want to connect to the micro view because that is the something is going to change for two, three reasons. One, that learning can happen anywhere. But when you talk about education, education has always been a systematic approach. So without systematic approach, you cannot bring the education. So it is very important that whosoever, whatsoever we are offering on the school campus or the in the institution anywhere, it has to be systematic, it has to be relevant, it has to be appropriate. Now, that's one thing. Now, to, to do that, there's another thing we need to understand. The teachers will be really under pressure to facilitate all these kind of things in a new environment because of the fact, I generally take this principle that out of 24 hours a day, a kid spend eight hours, they, they sleep for eight hours and they spend eight hours on the school campus. So the responsibility uh, we have is one third of the day and look at the parents expectations, right? So what is going to happen? Why, what I was referring to at the micro level, all your IT policy, your discipline policy, everything will change. And then I'm connecting to the exam point, what we were talking about. I am a little bit, so proctoring part is not a problem of the exam because you can have the technology expert and all. I'm actually a little worry about the, worried about the, the education part of the examination. You know, you, you bring discipline as education, you bring the exam and importance of examination as the education. That is, I'm a little worried because uh, I think in, in the country overall in last one decade or maybe one and a half decade only, we started talking about the importance of the academic honesty versus dishonesty and what all uh, so all these kind of things need to be coming in picture when you actually put everything in place in the policy. Now, the very interesting point, what you mentioned, overall, we understand the exam is stress is, is a big thing because uh, depending upon the learning style in this kind of atmosphere, the differentiation practice for the, by the teachers and for the students, all these things will create more gap between the students. Maybe the smart one will learn even the best one. They will become much better. And the one who is not been able to accommodate will be struggling this. So there will be wider gap. So automatically people will be facing this exam stress condition. But overall, as we normally say, it's very important to sleep well, exercise well. I would say exercise is important from the good hormone release. Yeah. 
eat well, sleep well. Uh, two, three things I can mention that you need to set your realistic goal. Where, where are you today? That is important, but set your realistic goal. Believe in yourself, right? Have a proper practice. The time management is going to be the key. The revision cycle, uh, the revision timetable is also the key factor. But the most important, what I see is, and what people struggle because what is happening in the daytime, they're just on the computer. So prioritizing while you're setting your revision timetable is going to be the key. Because these kids, especially at the school level, very difficult to identify that what is the biggest um, gap I am having in my, in my academic journey. So I think these are few pointers which the students should definitely consider while the, they're approaching the exam. Thank you. Thanks, Vishnu. Thank you so much. Praveena, closing thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, well, some of you might disagree with me when I say this. It might be a little controversial, but the first thing that I would say to any of my students or parents is, you know, how well they do in exam will not decide how successful they can be in life. So don't stress so much over it. A little bit of stress is healthy. We need it. We all need it. And we will always have stress in life. But how we take it and how far we take it, you know, it's not going to decide how successful you're going to be in life. So you don't really need to be so stressed that, you know, you, you lose your uh, peace of mind as well. So this is something that, the children, that children really have to understand. Even parents have to understand. Um, secondly, as Dr. Vishnu mentioned earlier, children need to know what their strengths are and the areas that they need to work on. They have to be very realistic about where they stand because every individual is different. Uh, we have different styles of learning and hence, you know, some children are more comfortable with the paper and pen based examination and assessment, whereas some might not be as, as comfortable with it. And some might be very comfortable with certain subjects, whereas they might be struggling in some other subjects. So they need to know their strengths and their weaknesses. And based on that, they need to set a routine and set a plan. And with this, I will, you know, just connect with, uh, with the story that I'm sure we all have heard, you know, the hare and tortoise story, right? Um, you, can, you can sprint, but if you sprint and you stop, uh, you might never reach where you need to reach. You will not be able to reach your goal, but take, you know, think about the tortoise. So, you know, plan your, plan your day. You will not be able to reach it, uh, you know, overnight. But even if it is a small step every day, 15 minutes every day, half an hour every day, one hour every day, um, depending on what your needs are and what areas you need to work on, set that and be, um, you know, resilient, be diligent, um, and, you know, take it through. And uh, even if you might not get the scores that you're expecting right away in the upcoming examination, that uh, discipline that you develop over time um, and the way that you teach yourself how to work um, and how to assess yourself, uh, um, I think will come in handy for the rest of your life. And such, you know, you have hundreds of such examinations in life and real life itself is an examination and then you will definitely do well if, if you have, uh, you know, that approach towards life. Thank you. Thank Ravina, Dr. Sheetal. Thanks, Singer. Uh, since this is going to be a closing comment as well, uh, you know, we've had already tips on how students can deal with exam stress. I have just a brief recommendation there and probably, um, again, I look at life as an opportunity. So every challenge is an opportunity. To Rahul's point, it's a great way to learn about integrity. You know, that if we are going to sit for an exam, what's going to be the outcome if we are going to cheat? Now, from an administrator and educator point of view, when we went into the pandemic, we were already using online proctoring, okay? And I had to learn new skills of how students can cheat online. So it was a learning process for me as well. So something to discuss, Rahul, as to how, you know, that value proposition of the educational technology tool is also important. So that's another debate, another discussion. And as with regards to just closing off this panel discussion, uh, Ingur, I'm glad we had this, um, you know, dialogue because we have to understand that a lot of speakers have touched upon the fact that the digital transformation or any change works very well with students who are intrinsically motivated, you know, have the ideal setup yeah. of infrastructure, technology, and so on. But what about those who are not intrinsically motiva uh, motivated? motivated? So can we use 
technology to enable or facilitate that? And if not, what do we need to look at? So like every class, I always say it's helpful to walk away from a conversation with a few more questions. And I have walked away with a lot of questions as well. So it's been a pleasure to speak with the panelists and I look forward to connecting with you and continuing the dialogue. So thank you so much, Ingo. Back to you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Sheetal, for those comments. Um, Cecilia, thoughts, views? Uh, well, thank you so much for this invitation. I think it's very interesting to hear from all different perspectives. I think um, one of the things that I keep telling my kids is just keep showing up, you know? That mm -hmm. is 50% of your battle. If you keep showing up, at the end, it's gonna pay off because this resilience that they are building, this constant effort to, we throw them in a world that it was unknown for all of us. And they took it because they trust us. So if we can continue doing that, if we can continue to develop the sense of, of trust and openness and, and to tell them, you know, sometimes I don't know things and it's okay. That's why we're learning. I think that will be something that uh, kids will take to heart. And in the long run, if we want to create, to develop the, the academic honesty that everybody's aiming for, it has to be on a daily basis. You know, you don't achieve that on a test. You don't achieve that with the final examination. It's, uh, it's a process that you have to be building on a daily basis. So thank you so much again for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to reconnect with India. Um, so thank you for the time and thank you for, for your thoughts. <laughs> Been a pleasure. Um, Ms. Anwa, your closing comments? Uh, hi, I'm sorry I got disconnected in between. There's patchy uh, internet connection. Um, I missed some of the, I think, interesting points people would have made uh, when I was not able to connect. But I, I want to bring in a slightly different angle here, uh, taking you know uh, the advice from Sheetal and and the others for students, you know, uh, about and all these qualities that we've talked about, having integrity, being resilient, resilient, and and the others. I think these are the things which will which will come in handy because if you if we look at uh, ten years, fifteen years from now, I think uh, whatever we are uh, studying at schools or colleges and the the jobs that we may be preparing ourselves for may not even exist in the next ten fifteen years, right? So and mm -hmm. so so I think but all these other soft skills and other qualities and uh, you know skills that we pick up. Um, uh, you know, and prepare ourselves with. I think those are uh, what what is uh, going to matter in the in the coming years. Uh, so, taking stress, but how you conduct yourself uh, in those stressful times is what will stand you apart from uh, the rest of the people. So, just just go go there. Don't procrastinate. Just just uh, do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Sir Janapaman. Uh, Rahul. Your closing comment on the discussion that we have had today? Oh, absolutely! Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I am uh, quite honored to be uh, amongst uh, such a distinguished panel. I, I think that this is a collaborative effort. You know, we have to be. It's a. It's there's a lot of improv that's involved in order for us to uh, adapt to this changing world, where uh, the the the, uh, the demand demands of businesses, companies, of the skill sets that are coming in. And then also that, you know, um, finding where happiness is going to drive people. That uh, it's not always going to, you know, finding happiness, people think that, oh, I'm going to get a great job and that's going to bring me happiness. And that's not always the case. And so that's why the role of education is so important mm -hmm. because finding, you know, you, everyone needs to find their own happiness. And the way to do it is through education of learning who you are. That's the biggest part I think of education is having people understand who they are, what they like, what they don't like. And it changes through time uh, as you grow older. And uh, you know, it's going to be a team effort to have everyone get there. So thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Sid, your closing comments, please. Yeah, I think uh, most of the exam related uh, stress that we've been 
seeing in the last one year has been mainly due to uncertainty uncertainty in exams exams getting deferred either the board exam or the entrance examinations after plus 2 so a lot of deferment happening that is creating uncertainty which is you know creating more stress among students and even this year there is a lot of stress when children think about these exams or the possibility that exams can keep getting shuffled because of the second wave and surges in various states happening due to covid so i think the children should uh, uh, maybe realize that you know some things are beyond our control they should be told some things are beyond our control just ignore that and just go on with life just chill So thank, you so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all, all the panelists. It was a wonderful experience, and I'm sure we we all have our own takeaways from here. You know whether uh, you know whether studentness is the key to everything, whether education is something that paves the way for their future, or they just it changes as they go along, or you know is is taking so much stress really worth the effort, or just about just getting up, dressing up, and showing up in the morning, and that's good enough, especially in this world. but it was honestly a very very interesting discussion some very important days from me uh, for me um, thank you so much for being with uh, today and yeah pleasure it's been an absolute pleasure talking to all of you thank you so very much we hope i hope that our paths are going to cross again some in future thank you so much thank you Thanks for having us thank, thank you everyone bye thank you bye thank you all bye have a good day bye